I want to preach quick today, but I, I have some, I believe that this is a life-changing word. If you have your Bibles, go to Proverbs 18. We're going to be looking several verses of Scripture, Lord willing. We've been talking about atmosphere plus climate equals culture. Today, we're moving to the last part of this and talking about the power of a blessing. I just introduced that at the end of the message last week. But today, we really want to get into it, and there's a lot of good word. How many wants your life changed? I'm telling you, if you'll take this word to heart, because it's God's word, and you'll take and put this into practice, it will change your life. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. I read that verse last week. I start there for this point. That verse is not religious rhetoric. It's word of God. Some of you have heard it read, quoted, and said so much that you quit believing it. But the Bible is saying that out of your mouth you have the power to either bless or to curse. In your mouth is either a miracle or misery. How do I know what's in my mouth? Well, what's coming out? Well, right now, church, I've just been, praise Jesus. No, no, I'm talking about Monday through Saturday. What's been coming out of your mouth? As we declare and speak the word of God, the blessings of God, because we know Christ, if we're saved, we're under the blood, we've received Him. And because the dove has landed, the dove, the anointing oil that I've been preaching about, and by the way, if you missed that, I encourage you to get the CDs. Real quickly, I just mentioned that we have little bottles of oil here in the basket. We've given over somewhere around 200 bottles of oil away, and people have been taking, anointing their homes, going through their homes, praying. And if you haven't already done that, I encourage you to do so. Take authority in your home. The oil, the anointing, it represents the power of God. It represents the creative power of God. Anointing brings creation. Blessing brings the goodness of God upon the creation. We need both. <laughs> you see, some things God creates. I mean, like you get saved, you're a brand new believer. But then you walk around without the blessings of God. Why? Because you start cursing yourself. Ooh, I'm telling you, this word will change your life. Some of you, you got saved. God created. He created a what? A new creature in Christ Jesus. But then you started looking in the mirror and saying, you're, you're no good. You can't do it. You start talking down about yourself. And what you've done is you started cursing yourself. And the Bible says that you'll eat the fruit of what you say. So when you curse... You say, wait a minute, I don't use four-letter words, and I don't. Can I tell you that cursing is not just four-letter words. Cursing is speaking anything out of your mouth that you don't want over a person, place, or thing. I know those who are taking notes just wrote that down, because that's, that's real simple. Blessing is just the opposite. It's to say what you want out of your mouth, what you want to see happen over a person, place, or thing. What's coming out of your mouth? Are you speaking cursings or blessings? When you declare over things that God has blessed and wants to bless and that you really want to be blessed, the opposite, you are cursing. And when you curse, you get the fruit of your cursings. But when you bless, you get the fruit of your blessings. I don't know about you, but fruit of blessings sounds a whole lot better than withered up old death that comes from cursing. Mm, I'm already preaching good. So if I've cursed something, what do I need to do? I'm so glad you asked. I've got a word for you this morning. Number one, repent. 
if you've cursed something that you know God wants to bless and really deep in your heart you want to bless person place or thing simple what do you do first of all you repent repentance is not just for the unbeliever it's for the believer I mean it's for the unbeliever if you're here you're running from God you've lived in sin guess what we sang about it earlier there's grace God will forgive you he will cleanse you he will not he will not honor your sin but he will honor your repentance and choosing to turn from sin that means I'm going in this direction in a life of sin but God gets my attention he draws my heart and I say whoop I'm going this way instead of that way because my eyes just opened up and that's the pig pen but over here is the palace Woo. I wish somebody today would trade the pig pen for a palace <laughs> you get a palace when you serve Jesus you get a pig pen when you serve the devil who are you going to choose you say but what about all the people in the world that are just you know living in sin and they, they get palaces hey watch what the Solomon says he says the wicked they may prosper for a season but you as the righteous will step back and watch them wither and die but you will not partake of their withering and their death So if you're here today and you need forgiveness of sin, but there are many of you that have already done that, but you're cursing yourself, and you're cursing your children, and you're cursing your husband, and you're cursing your wife, and you're cursing your home, and you're cursing your job, and you're cursing your church, and you're cursing your pastor, and you're cursing your neighbor. And the first thing that we need to do is repent. That means, just like for the sinner, as a believer, we're going in one direction with our mouth, and God gets our attention with His Word, and we say, Whoop! I'm wrong! That shouldn't be coming out of my mouth! And we turn and go the opposite direction and start watching our mouth. But first, we must repent. And this is where I'm going to really, the Lord's going to challenge some of you. Some of you that have cursed your kids, cursed your wives and your husbands, you curse family members, you not only need to repent to God, you need to look them in the eye and repent and ask them to forgive you. Some of you fathers that have cursed your kids and you've cursed your wife and you've cursed your home, you need to call your families together and you need to look your family in the eye and you need to repent to them one at a time. Why is it so quiet? <laughs> you see, when people you love, you've cursed, you not only need to repent to God, you need to repent to them. And the second thing you do is renounce. To renounce simply means you recall and re-say what you said at one time. Oh, that's good preaching. What do I do now? I know you're taking notes. You repent. And secondly, you renounce. Let me give you an example. If I'm calling one of my sons before me and I'm repenting because something came out of my mouth that I really don't want to see happen over them, nor do I believe God wants to see. I call them before me and I, I say, I call their name and say, please forgive me. I said this and I don't want that for you I first do that to God and then I do that to them I recall I renounce and I say I want the opposite you see when you've cursed yourself you don't have to call anybody but yourself <laughs> it's a little easier to <laughs> get free of that one because I don't have to deal with anybody else for most of us, many of us that's true, but for some of you it's not because it's not other people that you can't stand, it's yourself. And the reason you're always running and going is because you can't stand to be by yourself. You're really not as busy as you think you are, you're so busy because you can't stand to be by yourself. And the cursing that's come out of your mouth about yourself has caused you to despise yourself. Even as a believer. And what you need to do is call yourself to yourself and say, Self, I repent.
for saying that. You recall, you repent, you renounce. What if I can't remember some stuff? I'm getting older, I can't remember everything. I understand. Grace, mercy. That means you sum it up like this. And all the things that I can't remember, <laughs> I repent of. I recall them and renounce them. Things that I said that were not what is in God's word. And then the last thing you do, you repent, you renounce. The last thing you do is revoke. What does revoke mean? It means you take the acts of God's word and you lay it to the root of that cursing. And you cut it off at the spine. You know what it means to break somebody's a spine on something. It means that they will simply lay there on the floor, lifeless, unable to bring destruction. Spiritually speaking, the cursing will lay on the ground, sterile, and will not be able to destroy your life, your family, your kids, your marriage, your home, your church. For those of you who don't know, many of you do, but... Wednesday when I left about 2.30 out of this area praying, everything was great, fine, physically speaking in here. I even went to the back left. About 4.10 I get this call. Pastor Drew, it's an emergency, you got to get here quick. Something like that. I'm like, oh my, what was, there's a flood. I'm like, but he promised no more floods. <laughs> He said there's a flood. <laughs> and so the bottom of the back commode back here broke and flooded half the prayer room and all the way into the sanctuary, almost right there to the corner of the altar to my left or right. He said before I could get here, there was about an inch of water all the way through that area. By the time I got here, they had gotten a lot of that out, but of course it soaked in the carpet and now, I don't believe for a moment that God did that. He didn't want that. But I don't believe it's coincidence that I saw a dove in the middle of the parking lot in the middle of a storm and rain this morning. And so God says, the flood is over and the dove has landed. Mm. Out of my mouth, I bless this congregation and I declare the flood is over. And the dove is landing. You repent, you renounce, and you revoke. You lay the word of God to the spine of that cursing and you break it. How do I do that? Again, let me give you an example. If it's one of my sons and I have cursed them because I said something over them that wasn't God's will nor mine. I repent, I ask them to forgive me. I recall it, and I say the opposite. And then I say, Satan, I take the word of God in Jesus' name. And I lay the acts of the word of God to the root of that cursing that I said. And I break it in Jesus' name. And in the spirit realm, the back of that curse breaks. It's no longer active in my son, and there's freedom in Jesus' name. And then I go on and just say what I, the, the blessing, the declaration, after I break the cursing. You see, I've got a good word for daddies in this room this morning. I wish that it wasn't a rainy Sunday morning and this was overflowing today with fathers. But every father that's here, you're, God's brought you. You need to hear it. If you haven't blessed your kids, it's time to do so literally. See, it's easier to curse than it is to bless. Have you noticed that it just kind of comes out easy? It's natural for the flesh just to... But God wants us to bless. Fathers, if you have children and you never called them before you, and you never placed your right hand upon them and spoken a word of blessing over them, I challenge you to do so. You are the priest of your home and you have the power of a blessing in your spirit and in your mouth waiting to come out. You say, how do I do it, Pastor, when it comes to, you know, baseball and, and soccer and all the sports? You know, I'm right there and I can yell and scream, but when it comes to spiritual things, I just get all sweaty and clammy and nervous. <clears throat> Here's what you do, Dad. 
you man up, you swallow real hard. <clears throat> and you put your hand on your son or your daughter's head, your right hand, and you say what's in your heart, just let it come out. When you first start, you'll stumble a little bit, maybe. But I'm telling you, as you begin to speak it out with boldness and courage, as a son of God, as an authority in the spirit realm, the prophetic presence of Jesus will come upon you and you will begin to declare the future and the God's vision and His dreams for your children. And they will walk in the power of your blessing, God's blessing, because you, their earthly father, have authority in Jesus' name. And some of you are sitting there sad because you don't have a dad to bless you. I've got good news. If your dad has gone on to heaven, he never blessed you. Or if you have a dad, and I want to say to every person that's been born of a mother. <laughs> that means unless you're Jesus, that's all of us. <laughs> if you have a father that's still living, he's never blessed you, seek him out and ask him to do so. If he says he don't know how, you tell him. This is what my pastor said. If he refuses to do so and or he's not alive to do so, seek out a spiritual father. Someone you respect in the faith and or a pastor. Are you following me? You see, even as there's power in the cursing, there's greater power in the blessing. And so we repent, we renounce, and we revoke the cursing, but we practice giving the blessings. Watch this. Quit cursing yourself. Quit cursing your kids. Quit cursing your mate, your marriage. Quit cursing your home. Quit cursing your church. But instead, start blessing your kids. Start blessing your marriage. Start blessing your home. Start blessing your church. They don't just quit cursing. Start blessing. Are you... Are you I, I got to tell this real quick, can I? I, I'm not even looking at the clock. I don't even want to know. So a pastor was telling a true story. I've got to tell this. It's so incredible. I thought. So he's blessed the congregation to build a new sanctuary. And through the building, he feels as if the Lord put it in his heart to put an orchestra pit in the middle of the stage. It's a pretty large church. They had no brass instruments, nothing like that. And he thought that would be a blessing. And so... Leadership agreed to do so. It cost 42000 extra dollars to build the orchestra pit. So he started announcing weeks before the sanctuary would open, we're going to have an orchestra pit. Come see the music director if you play a brass instrument. Week after week, no one came. No one came. Opening date of sanctuary. Orchestra pit was empty. Several weeks. Months go by. He's frustrated. Every time he goes to preach, he said, I can't even look over at the orchestra pit because I'm so angry and mad at it and frustrated. And then he said, one day I'm praying and I'm just, instead of praying, really I'm whining to God. Anybody ever whine to God? Oh, don't be so spiritual, you know. <laughs> he said, I'm whining to God and all of a sudden I hear God say, well, if you would quit cursing the thing, I could bless it. He went on to say, you know, I always felt like God and I had a pretty good relationship and that just kind of hurt my feelings. <laughs> so he said, I just packed up my stuff and he was praying at, at the church and he said, I just packed up my stuff and went home. That's what a lot of Christians do. God doesn't say what they want him to say and so they just pack up and go home. God has treasure just waiting to get to you and through you. He wants you to be, a, he wants you to be blessed to be a blessing. Quit cursing yourself and others. So he tossed and turned all night trying to figure out what is this, what did God, why did he, why did he say that? Why would... And so the next week he went on a journey studying this thing that I'm talking about, blessing. And he saw in scripture where he, God convinced him that he cursed that orchestra pit. So the next Saturday he's standing before the orchestra pit and he says, orchestra pit, I repent for cursing you. You say, that's crazy. Sure it is. But it's scriptural. 
You hear me say it all the time. It's crazy to put mud on a blind man's eyes, but Jesus did it. He started, he repented, he renounced what he said, he revoked it, he revoked the curse. And then he started blessing the orchestra pit. Orchestra pit, I bless you. I declare that you will be a blessing to this congregation and to the kingdom of God. You will be filled with people playing brass instruments that will fill the atmosphere of the services here at our church. And it will fill the atmosphere of the heavens. And the glory of God will rest in the praises that come out of the brass instruments that fill you orchestra pit. I bless you. True story, he said not long after he blessed the orchestra pit and started blessing it, that a friend he had pastored in another state called him, said, they're moving, I'm moving, your state, your city, I'm coming to your church. He's so excited and he says, oh, before I hang up, I play a trumpet, can I bring it? He tells the story that they were flying, they were traveling so far and he, he said, don't you get on that plane without your trumpet. He was the first person to start playing in the orchestra pit. But before too long, as this one man began to play, it wasn't long, the entire orchestra pit was filled with brass instruments. What are you saying, Pastor? Quit cursing it and start blessing it. Real quickly, Genesis 24, verse 60. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Let me get down here. I got to... Verse 60, look at it. Abraham sends his servant to get Isaac a wife. How many of you students would like to live in Isaac's day? <clears throat> students? Isaac, mom and dad, well, not even his mom and dad picked out his wife. His dad's servant went and picked out his wife. <laughs> mm. It might make some things easier still anyway verse 60 listen to this so Isaac's Abraham's servant finds Rebecca and he, he knows in his heart that's the one the father if you read the story is isn't mentioned apparently he's absent in so many homes in the world and in America are absent of father. I know I've already challenged our dads, but I'm challenging myself. I are one. But I'm telling you, dad, it's your responsibility. You can be at home and still be absent. Show up as the priest and start blessing your home. You say you already said that, I know, but some of you needed to hear it again. So the father wasn't present, so the brother stands in his place. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gates of those which hate them. Look at me, listen to this. I'm almost done, stay with me. Notice what her brother said, I bless you with thousands of millions of offspring. Remember what God said about Isaac and A to Abraham? Your seed will be as the sand of the sea. So at 90, at 100, Abraham 100, Sarah 90, they finally have Isaac. And so the brother says, Rebecca, you're going to have thousands of millions of children. And those who hate you, you're going to stand at their gate and take authority over them. You, you have the gate, you have the city. So let me just say, there's three things that you don't do. One, you don't pull on Superman's cape. <laughs> Two, you don't ride down your car down the interstate at 70 miles an hour, stick your head out the window and spit. And three... You don't mess with Israel. You don't curse Israel. See, for some of you that don't know, it was from Isaac and Rebekah that Jacob and Esau was born. And Jacob was blessed. And his name was changed to Israel. 
And he had 12 sons and they became the father of the 12 twi tribes of Israel. They became the nation of Israel from which Jesus was born. God's chosen people and the tiny nation that exists today. And I tell you, no matter how much hatred and how hard the people of this world try to destroy Israel, it will never happen because God has declared them blessed. Two entities that the spirit of Antichrist hate. Israel and the true church of Jesus Christ. I mean the true church. Not the church that ordains homosexuals and say you can be preachers and you can be teachers. Amen. You're not the true church. You say you hate homosexuals. Absolutely not. I love them. I just don't love the sin. Amen. And you can't live in sin and expect to live in Jesus. It's either one or the other. That's not the true church. The true church is the one that takes the word to heart and obeys. That's how you walk in the blessing. You can't just, look, remember the oil on the hand? If you're living in sin, you put oil on your hand. You were not oily and now you're just oily. You just got an oily hand. But if you're saved, you put oil on your hand. Woo, you're, you're lethal and dangerous. Now watch this. Watch this. Look at me. I'm almost done. You get a... Save, you really get right, you turn from sin and you start obeying and you get a blessing in your mouth and you start speaking it out. Watch out, devil, you're lethal. <laughs> Where do you get that from, Pastor? Once again, I'm glad you're at, you ask. Deuteronomy 28, verse 2, you're still with me, say amen. amen. Hold your place, listen. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. Say overtake. overtake. Because you do what? Obey the voice of the Lord your God. How do the blessings of God overtake you? By obeying the voice of your God. <laughs> I'm telling you, you're saying words if, you, if you're not walking in the word. But listen to me. When you start walking in the Word, these blessings will overtake you. What does the word overtake mean? I studied this word. It literally means to overwhelm like a tidal wave would come upon the seashore and, and sweep away a child's sandcastle. You say, that, well, that sounds harsh, Pastor. Well, here's what God's trying to say with this word, overtake. Like a tidal wave, God wants to overtake your best efforts, sandcastle. And he wants to build a sturdy house of strength and joy. <laughs> I could just say a sturdy house of strength because the joy of the Lord is our... I've been preaching that and it just all comes back together. So what happens when you begin to obey the voice of the Lord and you start repenting of cursing and you start speaking blessings and you start receiving the blessing of the Lord over your life from your pastor, from spiritual leaders, from your father, other people in your life, most of all from the Lord. The power creates, the blessing puts the goodness on the creation. The goodness overtakes and wipes away your best efforts. And builds a sturdy house of strength. It's a house that is full of joy and laughter. Mm, I just love your word, God. That's good preaching, preacher. Come on. Deuteronomy 28 has 18 blessings. Look at this. 18 in, in, in Bible numerology is the number of life. What did Jesus say he came to do? To give life. And to give it more abundantly. Matthew 6, says, If you seek first the kingdom of God, all these things will be added unto you. Yes. It is not in the Bible that it's spiritual to live in poverty and have nothing. Nor is it in the Bible that it's spiritual to be rich. But guess what? It is in the Bible that he wants to add to you so he can add through you. See, I already said it, but let me give you one more verse. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. Look at it. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. How many times can you say all? <laughs> 
He said all. All means all. Look at it again in the New Living Translation. Verse 8. It says, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. That's what God wants. Quit cursing your finances. Start blessing them. When you get your check, put your hand on your check and say, check, I bless you. I declare that you will multiply. Say, can I do that? Yeah, you're a child of God. Power of life and death in your tongue. Quit saying, check, you are too small. You will never last. That's what some of you do. <laughs> you all right? You seem nervous. We need to pray for Miss Diana. Pink eye in both eyes. So we, we bless her with healed eyes in Jesus' name. <laughs> Look at this. Number six is the priestly blessing. I'm closing with this. Numbers 24, the first part says, The Lord bless you. The New Living Translation reads this way, May the Lord bless you. How do you start a blessing? Right there. How do I bless my kids? <sighs> They're going to kill me. First one I spot is you, Caleb. Come here. He's going to kill me. I don't know where Nate... Oh, there's Nate. He hit out. <clears throat> Dads, how, how, how do I do it? Some of you are so nervous. I mean, you can fix a car. You can get greasy. You have my picture. You can put Christmas lights on a roof. <clears throat> Laura took this picture. picture and um, she was in her car and she was nervous. She just sat there. But I can tell you, um, I'm not bragging on me. I'm bragging on God because about two weeks ago or so, after two services like this, I had to go home and lay down and... My oldest son, Nate, was the one on the roof. And there were a few other students and Pastor Drew that they all stood there and watched as Nate did all the work. But, um, <laughs> no, I'm teased. <laughs> sort of. But uh, Nate, Nate put these Christmas lights on, but they were old lights and many of them didn't work. This Saturday, we went shopping. Get the stuff. Give me the lights, extension cord. Let's get this right. That's a miracle. It's a miracle. Now I'm going to show you about blessing your kids, and Caleb's going to kill me because here's what he's going to say on the ride home. Why didn't you wait to call me up till you're ready for me because I've just went another pig trail. I'll get there. Hang on. I know what you're going to say. So November the 25th, incredible day in my life. It was two Sundays ago. My brother was here preaching, missionary to Africa, very sick. Lord gave a, a word to obey, lock yourselves away, just you and him, and pray for each other. And then when he got specific with me, he said, do it when you give the altar call in the 11 a.m. service. Well, that's the only one we had in the service. That was very hard for me because, as you know, I love to pray for people. So I left the altar service, and me, I went over and got Randy. Some of you remember, we went back in the prayer room, in the back room, and until 2 o'clock we pray for each, each other. Incredible things happen. I won't go into all the details, but number one, oh, the picture's gone. Anyway, number one, that miracle has happened in my life. Three years, three years. It, ha it started in November of 09, I remember. It started with a back pain, lower left side. After passing three kidney stones through March of 010, it seemed to kick in gear, however you want to put it, whatever has been going on in my body. And God has been healing me, but I've been talking about a, a very strong pain in my left side two weeks ago when Nate was doing the lights. After two services, all I could do is lay in bed. I was in so much pain. Not this week. <laughs> Not this week. And... While I was on the house, it so happened that my brother texted me. That's two weeks ago. So I'm on that very incline. He texted me. I feel my phone. I'm like. But I go ahead and check it. It's Randy. He said, please pray for me. I'm having awareness. Appreciation dinner like the ones I've had. I'm, I want to believe for, and you to pray for 15,000 plus to build the 10 churches in Africa where people are meeting on trees and, and tattered tents. And so I text him back a blessing. 
And I declared the blessing of 15,000 plus. So he texted me after I've already gone to sleep last night. I woke up, though, early during the middle of the night. And I saw his text, and they raised 18500 to dinner. But it gets better. I said, that's great, but how are you feeling? He says, it's a miracle. Now, remember, it was two weeks ago that we prayed. He said, it's a miracle. A week and a half ago. Everybody say, a week and a half ago. That means for half a week, the miracle... I hear Caleb growling. He's getting mad. Bless him. Bless him, Lord. Oh, and this is going on Facebook, too. Listen, a week and a half ago, that means for half a week, he still had pain. He said, for a week and a half, I've taken no pain pills, no sleep aids. I'm a thousand times better. It's a miracle! It's a miracle! What was wrong with Randy? Well, somewhere in between a parasite and a bacteria, big long name, swelling the brain, horrible headaches. Couldn't get free from it. His whole family going through it. He said, I'm a thousand times better. Don't confuse healing for a miracle. Miracle is instant. And we use the words, and I just did. But watch this. Symptoms does not mean sickness. You know in your heart God has healed you. Don't curse yourself out of your healing. Because healing is most often a process. Now, so dad, you put your right hand of blessing. Represents the right hand of the father lightly on your child's head. If you've cursed them first, you look them in the eye and you say, forgive me. You put your, head on, your hand on their head, just like this. And you say, Caleb, son, I bless you. I declare the blessing of my God upon your life. I declare that you're the head and not the tail. I declare you're above and not beneath. You say, I don't know all those scriptures, all those words. Just do your best. Caleb, I declare that the gifts that God has released in your life, they will come to the surface and they will flourish and they will manifest and the world will see Jesus through you. Caleb, I declare that the presence of God will be your greatest treasure. That your heart will hunger and thirst for Him more than anything else on this earth. Caleb, I declare that your generation will see Christ in you and they will be influenced to know that He is the best thing not to live in sin. Your generation will know through your life that it's not really cool to do drugs, to mess up your brain, but it's cool to finish school. It's cool to get an education. It's cool to honor your parents and to obey. Your generation will know through your life that it's really cool to run after Jesus. Son, I bless you with not only a hunger for the presence, but I bless you that the presence of Jesus will overtake you. And though you will hunger after him greatly, his desire for you will be far greater than your desire for him. And he will overtake you with his presence. His presence will consume your life. And as he consumes your life, the anointing, the mantle that rests upon you will overtake the enemies of your generation. And a great harvest will be won through your life. This day, I declare this blessing over you in Jesus' name. Stand with me all over the room. Come on, give the Lord a big hand. We praise you, Jesus.